Well, here we are back again. This is Odon Lafontaine, my good friend uh, from France. How are you doing, Odon? Good to have you back again. Listen, you've already put up a few videos and they've done very well, Odon. I think uh, your videos have gone faster with mm -hmm. more views than anybody else I brought on board from uh, an initial uh, initial introduction because you're new to our channel. You're new to a lot of my viewers. Some of my viewers have seen you on other channels, certainly on Mel's Sneakers Corner. And it's so good to have you bring in your background, your French background, um, but you've been working on this for 12 years. So there's an awful lot of experience and the comments that we're getting, and you've been reading the comments, I've been reading the comments. We're getting a lot of comments saying, this is finally, we're getting a holistic picture. It's this holistic picture people like. We're starting to see now the missing link, that missing link between the seventh century, uh, the Arabs, these, mm -hmm. these Nabataeans, these, these Quranic Nazarenes, how did they then come become the Abbasid version of what we now to know today as Islam? What's the, where's the missing link? And you're bringing in an awful lot of names, and especially in the last video that we put up, an awful lot of names, people were confused, an awful lot of people saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, too many names, too many places, where are all these people? And there was, a, and understandably, because it's new for most of my viewers and most of, even some of your viewers, I, I've asked you to go back and try to de define these people, try mm -hmm. to help us understand who these people were, where they lived, how they fit into the picture, and you're going to use maps and you're going to give the names. And, I, I, and then at the very end, what you're going to do is you're going to also put it in a timeline. You're going to put it in a timeline saying when the, the, the Arabs well, they're, they, you're, actually, you're even going to define what Arabs mean, because that's something uh, that's confusion for people. Who are these people called Arabs? They're not the people who today we call Arabs, and they certainly weren't what was earlier called Arabs, but do who are they? So you're going to start, mm -hmm. you're going to help us with that, and then we're going to end with the timeline to kind of conclude this whole mishmash of different groups that existed there in the 7th century, noticeably, noticeably, not down in the Hijaz, not in Mecca, Medina, but all up in the north, all up in places what we know today as uh, Jordan and Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and and parts of Egypt that's way up in the north that's not down mm -hmm. in the Hejaz so help us here uh, Odin I, I'm going to be excited by this because I've been waiting for this kind of a, a video to unpack it all to help us see who we're talking about give the names some definitions some background places where we can look at so that we can follow you as you create or as you introduce us to this missing link over to you thank you james hello everyone um yes I, i'd like to to be a, a bit more clear and precise about the the main protagonists of the origins of islam um in the previous video i had to go very fast and make a, a sort of big synthesis and um, I, I did not want to, to get lost in details, but details are important. And, uh, and many, many viewers asked me to define who the Nazarenes are exactly, who, the, who the, um, the Arabs are and so on. So I've put up, I've put up a, a little presentation about those protagonists. Yes. No. So the, the Quran can be used as a source to tell us about the, the people who wrote it, or the people who composed its text. And when you look into the Quran, what you see at first are homilies, sermons. Yeah. We see a preacher or some preachers um, speaking to an audience, preaching, in fact. And simply by looking at those, um, those sermons, we can learn about the language <laughs> of the preachers. For example, they speak an Arabic, but also we find a lot of Aramaic words in the sermons and a lot of a sort of an Arama Aramaic way of thinking. We can learn about their ethnicity, the community they belong, the cultural environment. We also learn about the religious training of these preachers. They know about the Bible, for example. They know biblical stories. They know text, commentaries about the Bible. And we also know about their objectives, their motivation. And we, uh, we have lots of um, examples in, in the Quran to, to understand who those, preacher, those preachers were. 
for example, they use uh, they use the word uh, Gehenna, Gehenna, Gehanama, which uh, relates to the Valley of Hinnom in Jerusalem, and which was in the biblical tradition a kind of um, an equivalent to hell and to the the hellish punishment. And we 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 see this word a lot in the Quran. 76 uh, times it is used in the Quran, which means that the preachers uh, knew about the, these words, so they had a sort of biblical background, a biblical training. They knew about it. And there are lots of other experiences like this, lots of other um, um, words and, and uh, examples like this in the Quran. And we learn a lot about the preachers this way. We also learn a lot about the audience that the, the, the preachers are, are speaking to. They understand the sermons. Maybe they don't. And, and when they don't, we, 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 we have the explanation. And so uh, according to what the, the preachers decide to tell the audience or decide not to tell them, we, we gather what they know, what the audience already knows, what the audience has to learn, and we, we understand who the audience is. We understand that mostly, mainly, the audience is composed of um, Arab Christians or Christianized Arabs, and they understand um, some very complex uh, theological concepts such as the Holy Spirit, for example, such as the Messiah, such as the Day of Judgment. So, of course, there are not pagans who don't know nothing about the one God and the biblical tradition. They, they also, a bit like the preacher, they also have a sort of biblical training or biblical background, not as elaborate, of course, as the one of the preachers. But we, we, we can conclude that they were Christians or Christianized. Um, when we look deeper into the Quran, we see also that the Quran names different categories of people. And uh, in order to understand what the, um, the Quran is about and what it has to, to teach us about Islam's origin, what it has to teach us as an historical um, source, it is um, very, very useful to understand who those people really are we have some wonderful tools nowadays to study the Quran, such as the website corpusquran.com or QuranGetaway.org, which allows us to make lists of all those categories of people, lists based on the um, consonantal uh, roots. And uh, this is what I did for uh, every, everything I'm about to, to, to expose now. Uh, and by comparing the, um, the meaning and uh, the, um, the context of every, um, every, every word in, in its context, we can gather who's, um, who those different categories of people are. Um, the Quran speaks a lot about kufars, coverers. We already spoke about them, but it's almost 500 times that the, the Quran used the KFA root, the same one as in Kufar coverers. So those are um, very, very important for the, for the preacher. The preacher really has to say something to, its, uh, to his audience about them. The Quran talks also a lot about the believers, the, the Muminun. There are more than 200 um, occurrences of the word. and if we also look into the, the, the verb, uh, which is based on the uh, ha, mn root, amana, um, there are also lots of other verses where, where the, um, the preacher talks about the, the believers, the one who believe. The believers, in fact, it's really simple to understand. They are the one who believe what the preacher is telling. So they were former. They were. They had a Christian background. They were. They were Christian Arabs, and because they believed in what the, the preacher is is um, is telling them, is teaching them, they became believers, and so they kind of um, became ex-Christians. 
because I was, as we saw it before, the, um, the preachers are kind of um, Unitarian Christians. That they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he is the son of God. They do not believe in the Trinity. And so they are teaching um, a sort of unitar Unitarian creed to the Arab audience, and, uh, which makes this uh, audience uh, an ex-Christian audience. The Quran also tells a lot about the mushrikun, the associationists, the people who associate uh, um, something, um, a false god, with the one god. There are 165 occurrences of the Esaka root. It, it also um, talks a lot about the people of the book, uh, as we explained, um, explained it before. There are almost 80 occurrences of the KTB root in which it designates a community or some people um, regarding to the use of the book, the scriptures. Um, the Quran tells also about the Muslimun, but the Muslimun in the Quran, in, in a very literal um, way, are not really Muslims in an, in an Islamic, uh, in the Islamic sense. They are the people who submit. And when you read the Quran, uh, when you try to, to make sense of a literal reading, you have to keep in mind that when you encounter a um, Muslim, Muslim, Muslim in, a, in a verse, it does not mean Muslim in an Islamic way, but only submitter, some, someone who submits to the word of God, to the, um, the teaching of, the, um, of a preacher, for example. But it does not have yet an Islamic meaning. The Quran also uh, speaks speak about the, the Jews as being Judeans, Yahud, or Hud, or people of Hud. And there are almost uh, a bit more than 30 occurrences of expression to, to point at Jews. And the Quran speaks also about the Nasara, with the en enigmatic NS NSR root, uh, 15 occurrences of the word. There are the Nazarenes. And we, we, have, we already have seen that those Nazarenes are not Christians, but they belong to the people of the book. They are Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is not the Son of God. Uh, and also the Quran speaks about other people, the people of uh, Pharaoh. The Quran speaks about the Arabs. There are 10 occurrences of the Arab, um, Arab world to, to point at the... I think the, the Arab people, <laughs> of course, there is only one occurrence of a word, of an expression, a phrase to, to point at the Christians as being the people of the gospel. Otherwise, there is no mention of Arab Christians, of etymologically correct Arab Christians. Because as you know, Jay, um, in Arabic, Christians can be called Nazarene, but it is an Islamic way of calling them but the Arab Christians call themselves Masih, people of the, of the Messiah, people of the Masih. This is their real name, and it is nowhere to be found in the Quran. And the Quran also sp speaks about a lot of other, other people, Romans, Sabians, and so on. They are not very important for our study here. Um, I, I, would, I would want at first to to focus on the on the Arabs, because there, there has been a lot of question about the Arabs. Um, you see, in the seventh century, of course, there were Arabs, but they were not a nation yet. Um, and in the external sources outside of the Quran, the, uh, it, you scarcely found uh, find um, a mention to Arabs. Those people um, are named Saracen, which means those who live under tents. Um, lots of Syriac sources speak about the Tagayes, which are um, Arab people from a specific tribe in northern Mesopotamia, the tribe of Tai. They also are called with religious denominations as Hagarins, sons of Hagar. Hagar is um, the servant of Abraham and the mother of Ishmael, which um, in the Jewish tradition, 
and um, a tradition which was which has passed on to the Arab. Um, Ismail is supposed to be a kind of um, uh, patriarch, grandfather to the to the Arabs, and so the Arabs were also called Ishmaelites. And we see uh, some other denomination in the Quran. The one, the Mujahidun one, is a um, very interesting one. They are um, pertains to the um, the event of the seventh century, which uh, gave birth to Islam, of course. But one could ask whether the Hagarins, the Hagarin word, could be a kind of deformation of Muajirun. I know that um, some scholar, some scholar worked about um, worked on this, and of course, a, there is the Arab denomination for the mainly for the Bedouin, the nomadic people. But at the time of the seventh century, the some Arab, of course, remain um, remain nomadic people, but uh, a large part of the Arabs settled and became. Um, farmers, fishermen, lived in villages, even in small cities. And, um, and the, but the, the Arabs, uh, the nomadic Arabs were mostly uh, traders, merchants, and they dwell along the trade route of the Middle East. So you see, there was no, um, the Arabs were a bit everywhere in the Middle East. They were, they were not only settled in Arabia, but also in Mesopotamia, also in Egypt a bit, um, all along the trade routes. Because, uh, because this, is, this is what merchants do. They had the caravanserai, um, um, so some kind of um, post stations. And um, the trade route was uh, very developed. The main trade route was the Silk Road, of course, from China, um, which arrived in, in Babylon, uh, crossed the Syrian desert. And uh, here um, in the region of Damascus, um, the goods were um, some, some, some goods were, were, uh, were put to the Byzantine routes. So this was here in Damascus, near Damascus, an important um, hub of exchange for the trade routes. And there is something very interesting happening here around Damascus um, on the Mediterranean shore. We find here traces of the Quraysh tribe, the famous Quraysh tribe, which is supposed to be the Muhammad's tribe. Um, a French archaeologist uh, in the 1920s found the remains, the archaeological remains of um, uh, the, uh, the Quraysh caravanserai near Latakia, in the, um, here Latakia on the Mediterranean uh, uh, shore. Um, look at here on this map. He found the remains of the Khan el Kourachie. And also, he found a river of the Quraysh here near Latakia. So the river of the Quraysh was named Nah Kourachie, and the caravanserai of the Quraysh named uh, Khan el Kourachie. And during the 1920s and, and before, the remains of the caravanserai were still to be seen. Okay, can I stop there real quickly so people see where you're talking about? If you look at the map, Everybody look on the left, see where Damascus is, it's known as Damas, and see where Beirut is uh, there. And so we're talking in north, north of what is today Damascus and north of what is today Damas, Tripoli. You can see Tripoli there. So it's up the coast from Tripoli, Latakia is where we're looking at. That is it's, exactly that today. No, nowadays it's, it's near the, um, the port of Tartus, where and, the and, Russians are today. And which country is that? That's Syria? That's Syria. That's Syria. Oh, Syria. So modern day Syria, it, it's called, give the name one more time. It's Latakia, Ladakia. Yeah, but what's Latakia. the name And, and um, the, 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 the big city is Latakia. And there is in the vicinity, the modern port of Tartus. 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 Is that the Tartus? This is oh. where the Russian settles for the, 
for the war against um, against Daesh. So here you find the caravanserai and of the Quraysh and also the river of the Quraysh. And this is not an invention. For example, in those very old maps from the 19th century, you also find the Ras Quraysh, the river, the Quraysh river. So I think this one is from uh, 1843. And I found also another one from uh, an American one. The former one was a, a British one. This one is from 1851, and also here the Rasko Rash is still uh, is still to, to be found. So near La, La Dikie, Latakia. So there were um, the, the, the Kurish tribe had a settlement there. It does not mean that they were all here, but it means that they were settled in a very interesting location for trade, because okay, it was the trade. end. Just so our hearers understand what you're talking about, why is he zeroing in on the Quraysh? For all of those who are familiar with the standard Islamic narrative, which is the narrative that you're taught today, which is what mm -hmm. everybody is uh, has to follow, Muhammad himself was from the Qureshi tribe, and his Arabic would have been Qureshi Arabic. And when Uthman, the third caliph in 652, eradicated and burnt all the other uh, Qurans that disagreed with the Qureshi dialect. So the Qureshi dialect is the dialect that only existed according to the standard Islamic narrative mm -hmm. way down in what is today Mecca and Medina, the Hijaz. So that is the dialect according to the standard Islamic narrative from the ninth century. That is the dialect of Muhammad's own family. So therefore, the original Quran would have been the Qureshi Quran. And that is what why uh, this is one, one reason why Odon is bringing this up. Almost everything mm -hmm. we have been finding that is important to the standard Islamic narrative that they place way down in Mecca Medina, what Odon is showing is no, 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 look at the maps, go look and see where these places are. This is way up there. There's a river of the Quraysh. These are the family of the Quraysh. They actually existed north of Tripoli, north, mm -hmm. way up in Syria, in the wrong place. Exactly. This is typical of the Islam. This is what the Abbasids did. They took everything from the north and they re brought it and they brought it down to the south. And many, as I think what you're going to say, Odon, they did, they did this as they moved. As they moved, they took their names with them. They took their traditions mm -hmm. with them. They took also, in, as we found out with the five stages of the, uh, the five stages of the Hajj, they even took their practices with them. Back to you. Interesting stuff. Love this. Um, there is a, a thing I want to insist on. Um, we find some some evidence of Quraysh settlement in this region here. But we know also that Muhammad was a merchant. So he was dwelling along this, uh, the trade routes and the, maybe with the preachers that we, what, that we know of thanks to the Quranic text. And so the ideas, the, the sermons, there were maybe um, dwelling also along the, 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 the trade routes. Petra, for example, was an, an important hub for those trade routes. Bosra, Bosra is, is also um, very known uh, in the standard Islamic narrative. And we see also that uh, there, there are links with Mesopotamia here, and, and Arabs were everywhere here, also in Arabia, in Mesopotamia. So from this northern region of Syria, the ideas, the sermons, could well have traveled um, among other, other tribes, other Arabs. So uh, let's keep this in mind. Okay, for those who are probably getting a little confused right now, when he says <laughs> Muhammad could have got it from there, be careful. If that were the case, if Muhammad was the author of the Quran, which I don't believe he was, I don't think Muhammad had anything to do with the Quran. Nonetheless, what he's saying is, even if the standardist narrative narrative is true and Muhammad did receive the Quran, if he was living way up there in what is north of Damascus and north of Tripoli, the Qureshi people in that where you see that, that red square is, then that would suggest that he just got this material from those sermons and those reportings and those homilies by, by the preachers mm -hmm. in that area who are along the trade route. Now, be careful. I know a lot of people are going to jump on you. Oh, ah, how dare you see, for, for example, for example, there, there are some verses in the Quran, so some sermons from preachers, 
which talk about um, a sweet water, a, a, a lake of uh, still water, um, where fishermen fish fishes and, and shells. And we, we don't find those, this kind of lake here in, in Arabia. There are no, no, no such lake. And, and, and there is no such lake around Medina or around Mecca. But oh, we, okay. we find those here. Here we have the, the Lake of uh, Galilee, uh, the Tiberiades Lake, for example. Here in, um, in the vicinity of Alep, we also have a very big uh, freshwater uh, lake. And um, this gives us clues as to where the, um, the sermons were, were, were preached. Yeah, yeah. At Great least those ones. So um, let's jump to the Kufar. Who are the, exactly the Kufar? I went a bit fast on, on it uh, on the previous videos. So um, let's, let's look a, 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 little, um, a little bit closer at the KFR route. In the standard Islamic narrative, the Kufars are the infidels, the ones who reject uh, Islam. The, um, they are misbelievers, unbelievers, but literally, it does not mean misbeliever or infidel or unbeliever. Literally, it means those who cover, those who cover the coverers. And um, in the Semitic languages, we have exactly the same meaning in Hebrew, Hebraic, and Aramaic. Uh, Kefer also means cover. For example, in Genesis 6, we see that Noah covers the ark with um, uh, tar, bitumen. Uh, yes, I think it's tar. And the word which is used here is uh, um, based on the Kefer roots. And it does so you see it means something like covering to cover, but the in the Semitic languages, when you have um I think the the, the, the first meaning, you always have thereafter derived meanings. So when you cover something, it can mean to cover the fault. So it can mean to forgive. And to cover something also means to keep silent, to pass over, to conceal or even to deny or to apostatize. And so we see here how the um, infidel meaning came into the standard Islamic narrative. At first, it was um, the, the, the word meant coverer. And thereafter, with the creation of the standard Islamic narrative, the, um, the scribes, the scholars, the Islamic scholars, they kind of drifted from coverers to deniers and then unbelievers. But literally, it means coverers. And we saw in the previous uh, video, excuse me, that those coverers were Jews who covered their sacred scriptures with other scriptures. And they claimed that those other scriptures were divine. And this script the Talmuds. In the seventh century, it was the beginning of the widespread of the Talmuds, particularly the Babylonian Talmud among the Jews. And um, some other Jews, namely the Quranic Nazarene, uh, did not agree with the Talmud. They thought it was sort of an abomination, a sacrilege, because people invented uh, a text and they put it over the Bible, over the, um, the, um, the sacred scriptures. They covered the sacred scriptures with the Talmud and uh, they changed because of this, they changed the meaning and of the sacred scriptures and they hid some prophecies, they hid some stories in the sacred scriptures and I think those stories relate to the coming of Jesus, the prophecy about the Messiah. And this is um, what the, 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 the coverers are accused of in the Quranic text by the, by the preachers. So we were talking about the Kufar. 
Now let's talk about the Mushrikun. The Mushrikun uh, are the one, etymologically, they are the one who associate, the one who commit shirk. Shirk is association. The standard Islamic narrative tells us that they are supposed to be polytheists, pagan polytheists, who associate the, their pagan divinities, deities, with the one God. But it cannot work. You see, a pagan, what makes you a pagan is that you are ignorant of the one God. Once you know the one God, you cannot be polytheist. You see, there is a contradiction. A polytheist cannot be a monotheist. So there is something very hard in the standard Islamic narrative by, by calling um, mushrikun polytheist. They cannot be polytheists, in fact. Um, and if we, if we look into the, the Jewish tradition, the rabbinical tra the tradition, we find the same word to designate Christians. Basically, in fact, the Mushrikun uh, concept is an attack on the Christian faith in the Trinity, in the, in the fact that Jesus is uh, the Son of God. And as a figure of speech, as a derived meaning, it could mean idolatry, but it cannot pertain to paganism, ancient paganism. So the Mushrikun we find in the Quran are Christians, in fact. They are the, the Christian, um, which uh, the, the preacher won't tell the real name. You see, this is why we don't find Masihi, the real Arabic uh, name of Christian in the Quran, because the Christians are kind of insulted by the preacher who doesn't want to call them Masihi, because it would mean then that they, are, they, 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 they would be di disciples of the Messiah, and he doesn't want to give them credit for this, so he calls them Mushrikun. It's a bit like the, um, the Jews during the first, second, third century who, who refused to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They had a name for the other Jews who became Christian and who recognized Jesus as the Messiah. They did not want to call them Christians or um, Mashaun in, in Aramaic or in, in Hebrew, in Hebraic, because it will give them credit for being the disciple of the, of the Messiah. They didn't want to call them this name, so they invented the name Natsrim, Natsrim, Natsaraya, uh, which doesn't contain the name Messiah. And so the, they, they do not give credit to the, the Christian for uh, following the true Messiah. Could so you say this that, is, hold on, hold on mm -hmm. the, the verse then, if this, if this Mushrikun really is a term for Christians or Trinitarian, those who believe that Jesus is God, would you say then that chapter 9, verse 5, the sword verse, slay the Mushrikun wherever ye find them, besiege them, lay in wait with them for every kind mm -hmm. of athlete, that is directed towards Christians? I think it's directed towards Christians, but there is something also um, to take into account. The whole of Surah 9 is very strange. It's in, in many aspects, it's different from the rest of the Quranic text. When you put all the, um, the verses in a timeline, you see something very specific about Surah 9. In Surah 9, the believers have come to the Masjid al-Aram. The Masjid al-Aram has been conquered. And in the standard Islamic narrative, it means that the, the, the Muhajirun, the, the first Muslim, uh, have finally uh, come back to, to Mecca. But in the real history, the actual history, it means it pertains to the conquest of Jerusalem, the real Masjid al-Aram was the Temple Mount. So we are here at the end of the 630s. This is not the same timeline as the previous um, sermons. And things have changed there because, um, because the, the, the project to rebuild the temple has been done. 
but the Messiah did not come. And so um, things were in motion. Um, the religion was changing due to the failure of the return of the Messiah. The Arabs got rid of the Nazarene preachers and they started to invent something else, something more. So when you look at the Saber verse, Surah 9 verse 5, um, it has to be put in, in this context, the context of the Arabic conquest, the Arab uh, conquest, the beginning of the Arab conquest, and the um, opposition between the, um, the, um, the Roman army and the Arab armies. So um, you see, w when you look into the Quran as an historian, when you try to, to make sense of it, to put it on a timeline, the, um, you, you get an explanation for this, this bizarre verse, the, the saber verse. But I think it relates to the, the Christian who are named uh, Mushrikun. Right. So, but if you really want to, to get a, a final answer about the, the real meaning of Mushrikun, you just have to, to do what I did, which is to put on a, on a, on a sheet every every verse with the word mushrikun or the SRK root in it. You put it like this, tens and tens and tens of verses, and you look into every one of them in Arabic, of course, thanks to, for example, the website corpus.quran.com or the other one, Quran Getaway. And there you will see that the Christian meaning of the word fits almost every, every verse that there is almost no contradiction, maybe for one or two verses. And there you can ask whether those verses um, may have been tampered with. It might be probable. But when you do this work, like I did, you, you, you put everything in, in, a, in a list and you, and you look at every, 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 every uh, occurrence of the SRK root. You come to realize it can only mean Christian. <laughs> this is what I did also with the KTB root in order to understand who are the people of the book, the Al Kitab. We spoke a, a lot about them already in the previous video. Um, and I already demonstrated there, thanks to um, some wise quotations of the Quran that they are not what the standard Islamic narrative tells us. They are not Jews or Christian or Muslims because those people are supposed to have uh, received a, a revelation in the form of a sacred scripture. They are only the Jews. They are the people of the scripture. When you really look into it, before Islam, there were only the Jews that were the people of the scripture who hold their scriptures as um, a divine revelation from God. Christians are not people of the scriptures. They are people of the Christ. And the, um, the scriptures are um, kind of a revelation, but we, every Christian knows that the scriptures were written by men. The Christian scriptures were written by men, but they are not like the um, Moses tablets um, and so the Christian cannot be uh, people of the scripture, people of the book. Um, besides, when we look into the etymology of kitab, the KTB roots, a kitab is not a book per se. A kitab is what has been put into writing, what has been prescribed, what has been ordained. And this is the exact sense of the word Torah in Hebraic. The, the Torah is what has been prescribed. This is the law. And um, we see also that uh, there is one occurrence of the expression people of the gospel. People of the gospel. So there is a way to call Christians other than people of the book, people of the gospel, which 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 could fit. So why call 
Christian people of the book, when you have already a phrase for them, people of the gospel, I think then, I think so that the people of the book are Jews and mostly only Jews. And this is uh, what I gathered from the, the study of all the occurrences of the expression, people, the phrase, people of the book in the Quran, and also all the other occurrences of the word kitab in the Quran. So it was a, a tedious work, but a very fruitful one, because you, you really get to understand what the Quran is about. Um, let's get now to the Nazarenes. There have been uh, a lot of questions and comments about the Nazarene. Who are they exactly? Um, we see then that the, the Quranic texts speak about the Nazarenes. There are 15 occurrences of the Nasara or Nasrani word. Um, and they are supposed to be Christians according to the standard Islamic narrative. But etymologically, this is not correct. Nasara, if you look into the Arabic meaning of the NSR word, it means to help, to support, to protect. And so this does not fit at all the a Christian meaning. Nasara must mean something else. And the linguists who, who have worked the, the, the question, such as uh, Robert Kerr, for example, um, they understood that the word Nasara is not an Arabic word, but it comes from the Aramaic. In Aramaic, we have the um, Natsaraya word with uh, a tsade here, T-S, it's tsade. And we have the equivalent in Hebraic, Natsri, like I told you before. And um, from there, I, I want to, to show your audience what does Nazarene mean? <laughs> See, Natsaraya is a very complex word. The Aramaic word NCA means to keep, to watch with care, to protect, to preserve, to conserve. And it is a Semitic language. It has many derived meanings, but it has nothing to do with the Arabic word NSR, which means to help or to support. Um, the, from this um, end meaning, we gather from the Bible that uh, it can mean um, the branch, Netzer. In Isaiah 11, there is a story about the, the branch, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, a Netzer, shall grow out of his roots. This is a prophecy about the descendants of David, of David, um, about the Messiah being a branch out of the David line. This is the meaning of um, the end set air root here, something which has been protected, preserved, conserved, watched with care. The branch is um, kind of. Um, the conservation of the, the David brood line. So in a derived meaning, the branch is the royal blood of David. And so the Netzer is supposed to be the descendant of David. So he's supposed to be a prince with a claim to the crown, to the a claim to the Jewish kingdom, to the crown of the Jewish kingdom. In also a derived meaning, the prince is supposed to be the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who is anointed with oil. The king is anointed. And so the Natsaraya are the messianic people. Before the coming of, of the Messiah, they are the people who wait for the Messiah. So this is one meaning of Natsaraya. Natsaraya in the, in the antiquity meant the people who were waiting for the Messiah out of the blood of David, of, uh, out of the um, <clears throat> David line. And for example, you have uh, this meaning in the, um, in the name of uh, Jesus and Mary and Joseph village, Nazareth, Nazareth. In Aramaic, it's Natsrath, 
excuse my uh, Aramaic, it's um, a very difficult language. And what does it mean? It is the city of the Messianic people. Um, it is a city which was um, populated by descendants of David. It was the city from which the, the people who believed in Isaiah prophecy were hoping that the Messiah would come. Another derived meaning, once Jesus has been acclaimed as the Messiah, the Nazaraya became the Messianic people of Jesus. They are the people who recognize Jesus as the Messiah, who recognize Jesus as being the Netzer, the branch out of the David line. So you see along the story, when you, you go along the timeline, the meaning change, changes. This is why it is a very complex word. <clears throat> and so the first Christians, the first disciples of Jesus who recognized him as the, as the Messiah called, were called Nazaraya. It was, um, it was kind of logical with what I just explained. And so the, the Jews who did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah called the one who did Nazri, which is the same word in Hebraic as Nazaraya. And thereafter, in Antiochus, and it is very important that this happened in Antiochus, the people, the Christians, the Jesus disciple, adopted the Christian denomination instead of Nazaraya. Because Nazaraya is a very complicated, compli complex word. It's complicated. You have to know about Isaiah. You have to know about Jewish tradition in order to get the messianic meaning. And also in Antiochus, in Syria, at the time, there were also other people called uh, Nazarene, Nazaraya. And they were not Christian. It was an ancient people that lived there in Syria for a long time. Uh, they were called Nosairi. And maybe it's the reason why the change of denom denomination from Natsaraya to Christian happened in Antiochus, in order to distinguish the real disciple of Jesus from the one, the other one, who had the Nosairi name without any link to, to Jesus. To Jesus. So Christian, Christianoi in Greek, and Mashiaye, people of the Mashia, of the, of the Messiah in Aramaic. And the Nazaraya denomination was kind of uh, left behind. Um, but we still find nowadays people who, call them, who are Christians uh, and use the Nazaraya denomination in India. You have the Christian of St. Thomas, who were um, Christianized during the first and second century, and who learned Aramaic, and who kept on the Nazaraya domination, Nasrani. But otherwise, in the Middle East, there is no trace of a Nazaraya denomination for Christian up until the fifth, uh, fifth or sixth centuries. Um, and so the word Natsaraya was not used anymore by Christian in the Middle East. It was used by other Aramaic speaking people who wanted to, 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 who wanted to, to, the, the world to, to know that they were the, disi the disciple of the Netzer of Jesus. But in, they had a, a strong link to the Jewish tradition. And those people, the Nazarenes of uh, the late antiquity, were described by um, historians and uh, church fathers and so on, such as Epiphanius or Jerome, who told that those Nazarene people from this time were uh, of Jewish descent and they accepted Jesus as Israel Messiah in such a way that they do not cease to observe the old law. And so we understand that the one who are still using the Nazarene denomination in the sixth centuries or the fifth century 
were Jews who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, but who did not want to be called Christians because they did not um, share the Christian creed. They kept on the old law. They kept on uh, abiding by Moses' law, by the Torah. And those people, the Nazarenes, there were um, many groups, but small groups. There were uh, cults, uh, very um, small sects, in fact. So this is the meaning of the Nazarene word. And we happen to find this word, this exact same word, in the Quranic text as Nasara. And from here, we can gather that the Quranic Nazarene might have something in common with those Nazarene we spoke about, those Nazarene from late antiquity, that maybe the Quranic Nazarene are a part of those Nazarenes from old, that they are um, a very, very small group of uh, Jews who accepted Jesus as, uh, as the Messiah, but did not want to become Christian, refused to see him as the son of God, and kept on uh, the Torah. So uh, this is also, this is what I gathered from the study of the Quranic text. Um, <clears throat> we saw this already on previous video, Jay. Uh, there were some 15, there are 15 occurrences of the, Nazar the word Nazarene in the Quran, and you have to do the work such as I did with Kufar and so on, and people of the book and so I've done it also with Nazarene. And we get it from the Quranic text that the, the, the Quranic Nazarene, the Nasaras, are those Jews who recognize Jesus as the Messiah and so on. Uh, so they were a small Jewish group that believed in Jesus as a political Messiah, kept on Moses' law. They opposed both the Christian and the other Jews, mostly rabbinical or Talmudic Jews. And we saw that those Nazarene from the Quranic text formed an alliance with some Christian Arabs, the one that are called the believers in the Quran, so ex-Christian. They told them their creed and their expectations that Jesus would come back on earth what he was, he was to come back physically with his body on earth. So this is not the Christian creed. And that Jesus was to lead the armies of the Nazarenes and the believers to establish God's reign on earth. This is what the sermons of the Quranic texts are about. It's all about judgment day, the establishing of God's reign, Amr Allah, um, and the goal, the, the, the mean, the mean to have Jesus come back was to take Jerusalem, to rebuild its temple, to resume the um, Moses religion there, the sacrifice and so on. So to have an altar, to, to, to come back to the old uh, Moses religion. That was, um, and the, the old um, rituals that took place at the Jerusalem temple and who were interrupted due to the destruction of the temple during the first century by the Romans. So those people thought that with resuming, with coming back to the old religion, with coming back to the true Jewish religion, things would, would get back in order and Jesus will come back to fulfill his mission because during the first century, he was pre hindered, prevent, he prevented from uh, fulfilling his mission of establishing God's reign because the temple at this time was corrupted and because bad Jews reigned over Jerusalem and the temple. So this alliance of Quranic Nazarenes and Arab believers, the Muhajirun, took Jerusalem at the end of the 30s. They rebuilt the temple there. We have lots of sources who, who, tells us, uh, who tell us so, but the Messiah did not come back, leading to the breaking of the alliance and to um, a cascade of events 
that will give birth to Islam. We will see this, I think, in another video. Oh, don't, can you go back to that slide? Of go course. Slide. Um, I think what a lot of people are questioning is why you call them Quranic Nazarenes. Why that term Quranic? That's your term, right? That's mm -hmm. not a term. You created that term. And you've also called it Quranic believers. You created that. That's Odin's term. Exactly. Because by doing so, I intend to point that the proof of what I am saying is in the Quran. The proof of the existence of these Nazarene people is the Quran. And that it is the Quran itself, the Quranic text that defines those people. Okay. I, you I see, there is... Um, Everybody, are you hearing that? What he is not saying that this is a term that was well known in the seventh century. There is no people called Quranic Nazarenes in the seventh century. This is what Odon is calling them. Are you all fair? I think that may have caused a lot, a lot of people of confusion because they, what I hear in a lot of the comments is there was no Quran. How can they, they didn't have a term Quranic Nazarenes. We don't see that written in any text. Why is Odon referring to these Quranic Nazarenes? So that is your term to suggest what the Quran is saying is happening in this. These are the people that mm -hmm. the Quran is referring to. Okay. You see, Jay, when you look into the Quran, you find the Nasara word. Yeah. So you, you're saying, hey, of course, those are Nazarenes. But when you, you speak about Nazarene, then you come back to the history and the very complex meaning of the Nazarene word. So are those Nazarene from the, 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 the fifth centuries group? or from the first century, or from the antiquity. Yeah. And we get lost in, 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 in those details. And we don't get the point. The point is that the Quran, the Quranic text, as an historical source, defines a small group of Jews who call themselves Nazarenes and who formed an alliance with Christian Arabs and so on. And I used the term, the phrase Quranic Nazarenes to point exactly at this. We have the proof of the existence of the Nazarene in the Quran. They exist. And we have very strong evidence in the Quran to, to, to ascertain, to found the existence. You see, um, I have published my work, my first work in... Uh, 2014, I have received a lot of critics of people telling me, you don't have material enough to justify the existence of Nazarene. All we have are very ancient sources from the 5th century, the 4th century. We have nothing from the 7th century. Yet we have, we have the Quranic text. So the Quranic text as a whole does not is not as, um, as a whole uh, seventh century text, but lots, lots of it comes from the seventh century. And so we have a seventh century evidence of the existence of those Nazarenes. This is why I call them Quranic Nazarenes. Okay, thank you. And about those Nazarenes, we have some, it's not evidence, but we have some clues in the literature from the first centuries, from the late antiquity. We have some um, clues about who they were, who, about um, where they might have come from. Um, in the writings of uh, Epiphanius of Salamis in his Panarion, um, he tells us that in the fourth century, there were some Nazarene people who came from the first Judeo-Christian community of Jerusalem. He tells us that uh, during the events um, relating to the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 66, 67, 68, the, the Roman let the non-fighters non -fighters the people who, did, who didn't want to fight them, they let them flee Jerusalem. And so um, the first Judeo-Christian community in Jerusalem, under the authority of James, the brother of Jesus, or cousin, or, or cousin of Jesus, 
the first uh, this first community fled Jerusalem and uh, took refuge uh, in the northeast of, of Jerusalem. And after the Roman victory, after the destruction of the temple in 70, they came back to Jerusalem and they resettled there. But some of them did not want to come back. Some of them um, stayed behind and parted from the, this, this first Christian community. And those were the, the stem, the, the, the origin of the Nazarenes, the Nazarenes we are speaking about. Uh, Epiphanius tells us that they fled to Pella. Pella, Pella it's here. They also fled to the Piria region, which is uh, Transjordan, the east of the Jordan River here. They fled also and they spread afterwards uh, in the near the Golan Plateau. Here, I think it's called the Batania, Batania region. And um, Epiphanius also tells us that some of them went to Syria near Aleppo. This was in the fourth century. And this fits what we saw about the Quraysh tribe. Let's really look into uh, René Dussault, the French archaeologist. Let's really look into his work as Edouard Marie Gallet did. And we will see that in this very region where we found the remains of the Quraysh tribe, we also find lots of clues pertaining to the existence of Nazarene people there. Here I rely on onomastic. Onomastic is uh, the science of the places names. When uh, you, you really look into it, you see when you give a name to a place, it, it goes uh, through the centuries and they are very rel reliable to find what, um, what happened centuries, tens of centuries before. For example, in France, we have lost the Gaulish uh, language. It was an, an oral tradition. Almost everything is lost, but for, but for um, names of places which were given uh, during the, the, the time of the, of the Gauls and which passed the centuries up till now. For example, names of river, like the Quraysh tribe, the, Quraysh, the river of the Quraysh, uh, of the Quraysh I, I spoke about. But we have, for example, here uh, the river of the Nazarene, Wadi and Nasara. We have the Mount of the Nazarene. We have villages and towns which are named with the NSR route. Uh, and so this links di directly to what um, Epiphanius of Salamis told in his, uh, in, his, in his writings. But furthermore, when you really look into this map, you find other names that are very, very interesting. You find, for example, north of Alep, an Abu Kab, very strange name. You also find an Abu Kubais, another strange name. Abu Kubais is also the name of a hill in Mecca nowadays. You find also an Abil Bet Makkah. And you find like this many names that um, kind of relates to the standard Islamic narrative. And what we can um, what we can uh, get from it is that the, um, the people who created the standard Islamic narrative they took names from their socio cultural uh, environment. They take names from the the places of the origins. You see, it's a bit like when the um, the Pilgrim Fathers, for example, and all the, the settlers from Europe came to America, they named the places like uh, New Amsterdam, New York, New Orleans, or for example, Paris in Texas, because they, they took name from their um, socio-cultural environment, from their Weltanschauung. 
And I guess this is what happened there. We find, uh, thanks to this, we have found um, a series of clues that shows us where, where, where it all started. So as a conclusion, uh, I want to show you um, a little uh, diagram, a chart I made uh, to, to make sense of all of this according to a timeline. Um, in order to, to describe who the protagonists of the um, origins of Islam were and uh, how the, um, the meaning of their name evolved through the events of the, of the creation of Islam. So we had at first, at the beginning of the seventh century, what I call the time of the covenant, the time of the alliance between the Arabs who were taught by the Quranic Nazarenes. So they were ex-Christians and they called themselves the they were they called themselves the believers, and the preachers called themselves the believers. And so there was a covenant between them and the Nasara, the Nasara of the Quran, the Quranic Nazarenes, which are also called by Edouard Marigales Judeo Nazarenes. And together they formed the community, the Ummah, which was to take Jerusalem and so on and have Jesus come back. They were opposed to the Kufar, the coverers, who were the rabbinical Jews. And we saw that together, rabbinical Jews and Nazarene Jews formed the Jews, the whole of the Jews, the people of the book. And there were also the Christians who were called associationists, mushrikun. And rabbinical Jews and the Christians were the enemies of the believers, the enemies of the Ummah. Oh, then before you go on, what's the time period of the time of the covenant? Just give us a, a date. Um, I just told it. It was at the beginning of the seventh century, so up the until the conquest of Jerusalem. So something yeah. like till well, six thirty-seven. Up until six thirty-seven. Up until the the end of the thirties. Okay. Because what happened at the end of the thirties? What happened? Let, let's let's pick a date in six forty. Uh, the covenant was broken. The covenant so between... 37 up to what time? Here, I'm just talking about the breaking of the covenant. So 640. And okay. It will be 640 up until, I guess, Abdul Malik times and maybe the Abbasid times. So once the covenant up. has been broken, the Arab believers parted from the Quranic Nazarene. They rejected the um, former masters in religion. They reject, rejected the preacher who told them that Jesus would come back and he did not come back. So the Quranic Nazarenes, the Nazarene preachers failed. Hence, they were seen as enemies now of the Arab believers. And we, we see this in the Quran, in Surah 5, in the fifth Surah, there is a mention to the breaking of the covenant by the Nazarene themselves. So the Arab believers <clears throat> uh, had uh, new enemies. <laughs> they, they, they considered then whole, the whole of the Jews, the people of the book, the, the rabbinical Jew, as well as the Nazarenes. So the whole of the Jews, uh, they considered them as enemies. And in 642, um, is it 642? Maybe it's 640. I don't remember exactly. The Jews were expelled from Jerusalem. 640. It's 640, 640. It's in Moshe, Moshe Gil book, uh, History of Palestine. He, he gathered the, um, the Jewish tradition. And in this Jewish tradition, you, you see that this very strange event of the expulsion of the Jews from Jerusalem in 640. This is uh, because the covenant has been broken and the Jews that were expelled at this time in 640 were the Nazarene Jews. And the Christian remained the Mushrikun. They still were called Mushrikun, associationists. And the whole of them, Christian and Jews, were seen as the enemies of the believers. And we see this in the Quran. For example, 
I think it's Sura 5 verse, uh, it's either, I think it's 51. The, um, here we see that the Jews and the Christian are supposed to be the enemies of the believers. And they are supposed also to be allied one with each other. So this is the evolution due to the breaking of the covenants and um, which lasted until the creation of the standard Islamic narrative. This is why, uh, Jay, when you asked me uh, about the, the timeline, I said uh, up until Abdul Malik and the Abbasid times, because I guess the standard Islamic narrative, its creation, its invention started uh, after Abdul Malik, and it was mostly written during the Abbasid period, Abbasid most times. Of us, most of us pretty much put that from 749 mm -hmm. onwards. We don't put it before mm -hmm. because almost anything before 749 has been eradicated. So we don't know. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this is the problem that uh, all of us are dealing with. Remember, it's, you have the story of uh, al-Bukhari, who was given 600,000 of these historical narratives uh, that he was to go through and whittle them down. And digga, 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 he threw out 98% and only retained 7,397 out of 600,000. What were those 600,000? This is that which preceded 649, uh, 749. So the standard Islamic narrative that we pretty much say from the time of 749 on is the standard Islamic narrative. That only gets written down in 833 and 870 and 875 and 923. So it gets written down in the 9th and 10th century, but it begets, it gets be put together. It's beginning to be put together by the Abbasids up in Baghdad from 749 on. So I would put 749 onward. Not, not, I, would, I would not include the Umayyad, the Umayyad mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. I agree. So in the standard Islamic narrative, what do we find? We find that the Ummah is made of the Muslims, which are the believers. Muslims and believers are not alike. It's one and the same. We find that the Nasara have become the Christians and the Jews are the Yahud, Al-Yahud. Together, Muslims, Yahud and Nasara, Christians, they form the people of the book. And this is the, so a new definition of the, the, people, the people of the book. The people of the book are nowadays a sort of bizarre, odd mix between uh, people of different religion, different creed, different way of behaving with the scriptures. But they are called people of the book nonetheless. And the Mushrikuns have become polytheist pagans. But because they are pagans and polytheists, they are also, in a derived meaning, accused of being idolaters. And so, because the Christians are supposed also to be idolaters, in a derived meaning, mushrikun, in the standard Islamic narrative, can mean also a Christian. And together, Yahud, Christians, and mushrikun, they form the Kufa. But they are not coverers anymore. They are the infidels. They are the unbelievers, the misbelievers, those who refuse Islam. And now we have with this timeline an explanation for all the oddness, all the, the bizarre stuff in the standard Islamic narrative. Why, why Christians are supposed to be people of the scripture, whereas they have no, they, are, they don't have the same reverence to scriptures than Muslims or Jews. Why is it that Nasara, Nazarene, are supposed to be Christian, even though in the Quranic text, in, in some verses, it cannot, it cannot fit? And the Quranic text contradicts this definition of Nazarene being Christians. We now have a sort of way to decode the standard Islamic narrative and to understand what the Quranic text is really about. If you take this chart, if you take this diagram, you have um, a sort of um, new way of reading the Quran with the real meaning of the words. And there you will find that the Quran can make sense, that the Quran describe events from the beginning of the seventh century, that the Quran can even be logical. And so this is... Um, 
an um, unexpected um, discovery. Okay, Adan, this is this is excellent. I, I mean, you have done what we asked you to do, and you've uh, you saw from the comments people were getting confused trying to put together who all these people were. So you've done us a favor, and you've done that in just the last two days. Thank you so much, and uh, all of us thank you for what you have done because uh, you uh, you realize, and we all realize that uh, for you that you've been working on this for twelve years. So this is all normal stuff for you this is what you're mm -hmm. this is your bread and butter and so for you it, it you, you you go through it so quickly for the rest of us who are hearing it for the first time uh, we do need to have some uh, definitions and you did that and you and you said listen if we're going to be looking at the historical co context why don't we start with the quran itself let's just start with the quran for heaven's sakes because the quran does give us a window into what was actually happening. Now, by saying that, you're assuming that the Quran is correct and the Quran actually is putting together what really it was existing in the seventh century. There, you're going to get some pushback on that. Nonetheless, that's a great mm -hmm. way to start. It's much earlier than the traditions. And we've asked people, stop and throw away the traditions. We're sick and tired of the standard Islamic narrative. It gets everything wrong. It gets all these names wrong and the places and dates and events wrong. Let's start with the Quran, which did come earlier. We do know the Quran probably, as you and I are agreeing, it was derived from writings from that period. So let's just say that the Quran gets it much better because it's closer to the events that it's referring to. And you start by looking at different people's names. And you talk about and you say, first of all, if you're going to look at the Quran, understand it's made up of sermons by people who are writing in that time period. And their sermons, take a look at the sermons and look at the people they're referring to. And then you gave a whole list of people that are there. And you, you showed how many hundreds and tens of times these names come up and up again. The Arabs you started with. Now, the Arabs, you were very clear that the Arabs are not the Arabs we speak of today. When we think of Arab, we think of Saudi Arabia. And we need to be careful. Because that is not the, what Arabs were historically. We know way back in the Roman periods, Arabs were only Arab Petraea, which is up in what is today Jordan and Syria. And you're saying, listen, the Arabs have other names they give to themselves. Saracens is a name. People mm -hmm. who live in tents, uh, they're called Tayaye. These are the people from up in Iraq, up in what in Mesopotamia. The Hagarin, people who were in the line of Hagar, uh, Magre or Muhajirun are derivatives of that word Hagarin uh, from the line of Hagar. Ishmaelite would also be a derivative not derivative, but also the son of Hagar. So all these different names they gave themselves, but they were all people up in the north. And they also followed the trade routes. So look where the trade routes are, and you will see where these people are. That's where they mm -hmm. were. They were traders. So they were nomadic. So they were moving all over the place. You can't define them as one place, one, one, one environment. And that's so helpful to hear you say that. And then you zeroed in on the Quraysh, and you gave the Quraysh. You said, listen, the Quraysh that you see, probably is not the Qureshi that we know. The standard Islamic narrative says the Qureshi are these people that lived in Mecca and Medina. Muhammad was a Qureshi. He mm -hmm. comes from that tribe. Therefore, they had to live in the Hijaz. And then you put up and you said, no, hold on a minute. Let's see what the maps show us. Let's see what history shows us. If you look at the historical re record, these Qureshi are from Latakia. Latakia is right up on the coast, right on the Syrian coast above Tripoli. That's way up north. I mean, you're getting up there. You're getting up towards Turkey now. And so you're mm -hmm. really talking way up by Aleppo. That's where these Qureshi are. And there you see a river called the Qureshi. And you say, listen, names don't change that much when, it, when you're referring to a town or a river. They usually keep the same. Now, people can change and take those names with them. And you do talk about that, that people do that. And that's why when they left, they took the names with them because they took that which was familiar. They took that which made them feel at home. And so that stands to reason and that if people coming down to Mecca then incorporated that word Quraysh in Mecca, well, that or Abu Kubais, or Abu Bablis, the, the, mm. the, the mountain that's there in Mecca, that is also way up in the same place that the Quraysh are from. Uh, and you talk about other places that also, I mean, it's terrific how you're going and saying, let's just look and let history tell us where maybe these places mm -hmm. originated. And that may tell us then where they were, the, where then they were borrowed from. You go into the, you talk about the Kufar. Now, according to the standard Islamic narrative, they are the infidels. But you're saying, no, no, no. If you look and unpack the word itself, it's the coverers. And it, um, it went from that meaning of coverers, those who cover and those who hide, those who change, those who manipulate, those who create with their own hands. Uh, and then you say, 
they then became the infidels in the standard Islamic narrative. Let's go to the original, let's go to the original text. And then you went and you unpacked Mushrikun. And I thought it was fascinating because Mushrikun have, I've always been, and Muslims always tell me today that I'm not a Mushrik, that uh, it's the idolaters, it's the Hindus, people like that who have, who worship other gods. And yet you're saying, no, really, if the, Quran, the Quranic term for that really is talking about those who equate another God, who commit shirk, and that would be the Christians. And it was primarily aimed at the Christians who are the Trinitarian Christians, uh, the Monophysites, and those who actually were the uh, Byzantine Christians of that day. They were the Mushrik. So the word Mushrikun, which is masculine plural uh, in Arabic, is referring to that whole group. And we need to then look at that, that this was an attack against those, not necessarily the idolaters in India, but actually the Christians right next door who were their neighbors. You then unpack the word kitab or kitab uh, and said that it's found 260 times. And you said that most almost in the standard Islamic narrative, and I've heard this all my life. In fact, I hear it from all my Christian friends and missionary friends and everybody that this includes us. When in reality, the Quran does not include us. It's actually just the Jews. The Qutb, those who are the ones from the real book, the old book. And so therefore, you're, you're, you're making a new claim here that I've not heard before. Fascinating, because that will put a whole paint, a whole different view of how we interpret these verses from here on out. And then you end with Nazarene. And I like what you've done to Nazarene, because... The Nazarene is what you, the claim you're making, and you're saying that these people that we need to watch are the Quranic Nazarene. That means the Nazarene, they're in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that these Nazarene are those Christians or Jews who have, who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but that he's not God. And they're still waiting for him, says second coming. Am I correct on that? They are waiting for him to come back physically. A as, as a person in, in, in flesh and blood and to fulfill the mission he could not fulfill during the first century and that got corrupted so now he's going to have to come a second time which is actually echoed in the islamic traditions the islamic traditions do say the same thing that jesus exactly. came the first time he did not fulfill his mission he has to come a second time and at the time when he comes the second time he will destroy all the crosses kill all the pigs have a wife have his seven children and then he will rise again so in some ways there is an echo of that in the islamic traditions of this very mm -hmm. point of the nazarene in the seventh century but and i have a, a proposition for you jay which is another video when we will um explain all this, all this, um, all the change in Jesus, um, in the, the Jesus conceptions of the seventh century. Okay. Jesus okay. was supposed to come back. He did not come back. People kept on waiting for him to come back, but ultimately he did not come back. And Islam, Islam took the, um, is, Islam started now. Islam started there. Okay. And we're going to get that. Actually, you're going to talk about that in a video up to come that we already have planned. But then you go on and say that these, not, take a look at the map again. And you've got brought us back to the map again. You say, well, look, take a look. Look where these Ansari are. Look where these Nazarene are. They actually are way up by Latakia. They're up way up in northern Syria. Mm -hmm. They're, again, once again, the very people that the Quran's referring to are too far north to be down in Mecca. Mm -hmm. So if this is the standard Islamic narrative, which you, um, which we all know is what began after 749, began during the Abbasid period or was created in, uh, and then finalized in the Abbasid period, that has the, the Nazarenes even in the wrong place once again. Because historically, we know there were no Nazarenes that far south at that time, at the time of the six, 600s. Now, you then put, uh, ended with a great graph. And I hope people grab that graph, copy it, print it, and keep it in front of you because that graph goes through three different time periods, about 600 to 630. That is the Arab Nazarenes that you're talking about. The Arabs and the Nazarenes who are together, who had, who have an alliance. Mm -hmm. That alliance is then broken in around 637, 638, and from 630, the second, uh, the second column, you then have where the that that fissure of that that alliance, and then you have the Arab believers who become now the Ummah. And they are the ones who now take on that mantle. And that continues all the way up through the Umayyad period. You wanted to put it Abdul Malik. I would suggest we put it at, at the time of the Abbasids come in because that's the Abbasids who then 
continue, I, I put in a whole nother definition of the Ummah, the believers, mm -hmm. and that is the word Muslim. And they are the Muslims from there on out. And that now, those are now the Ummah today from 749 up until as we're speaking right now. Very helpful graph because then you put all the different groups. Look at those different groups that Odin has put there and follow it through. You can see it's a sequence. Now, however, how are you going to show that sequence? And what is it we're going to do next? Well, Odin, I've asked you to do something and, you, and you've agreed to do that. I want you to start with the coins, if we could do that next. Let's go to coins, the uh, coins and epigraphy. Coins and inscriptions. Coins and inscription, because those are real, real uh, witnesses of the seventh century, what really happened during this time. What do you mean so by I'm that? Not you can't mm -hmm. destroy coins and you can't destroy rock inscriptions because they are what they are. They are they are indomitable and they're as pristine today as the day they were carved or the day they were minted. Because mm -hmm. they were minted and carved in the seventh century, in the very time period we're looking at back here, and because they were carved and minted in the very areas we're looking at, notice mm -hmm. everything that Odin has said today is not from down south. It is from north. Therefore, the coins are also from up north, and also the rock inscriptions are from up north. And we want to look at those coins, uh, the western coins and the eastern coins. And we want to look at them. We want to show the evolution that the coins show us. Once we show the evolution, what the coins show us, what Odon has promised to do is put together a very sophisticated graph. I've seen it. And it, boy, it looks amazing. And he's going to show you this graph and he's going to unpack the whole sequence of how everything happened. And when you see that, then you're going to understand where the Nazarenes are, where the Arabs are, where are these Mushrikuns, who are all these people, and what actually is, where is that missing link that we've been looking for? You know, everybody's talking about the missing link. You can't find it in biology, but you can in Islam. And we're going to show you, Odin's going to show you where that missing link is. And you're going to be, it's going to be fun to watch as he unpacks that graph. It is sophisticated, it is in intricate, and he'll be using the coins and the inscriptions first to take you along the way. And then when you do that, folks, you can, you will then have the golden, the, the, what do I want to say, the golden <laughs> slipper finally to understand how Islam really began. But until that time, we have a little bit more to wait. We've got to got continue on what he has done, where he is going, and what he has to show for us. Any last words, Odin, before we finalize this episode? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where to start. Um, I think we are living um, in a fascinating time. Thanks to the internet, thanks to the accumulation of knowledge, we are about to unveil one of the greatest mysteries of human history. We are about to, to understand Islam much yeah, better than the Muslims foundation. themselves. Yeah. We're going to show you how Islam actually began, Islam's foundation began, and to show you what went wrong. Okay, God bless you. This has been great. Thanks, Odon. Thank you, Jay. One together. I know you put this together real quickly just because of all the questions that were up there, but that shows that you are answering their questions and you are taking them seriously. Therefore, you who are watching, do comment and there uh, in the comment box. That's it. That's what it's there for. And do let us know what Odon is saying. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Do you disagree? Is there something he said wrong? Is there something he should be correct? Is there some new material that you know that he doesn't? Help us. This is where we've learned and we can help each mm -hmm. other. God bless you. Keep us peer-reviewed and keep us honest. This is Jay and Odin, 3,000 miles apart. Over and out.